In our series charting the history of the world through man-made objects. The BBC is working with museums across the region and looking for your help to compile a list of items which bring history to life. Tonight, Kim Riley reports from Cambridge with a story both heroic and tragic. Pupils from Parkside School had a very special lesson this morning at the university's Scott Polar Research Institute. So this, then, is Captain Oates's caribou sleeping bag. Introduced to an iconic item from the British Antarctic Expedition a century ago. Captain Oates was one of the five members of what we call the Polar Party, which was part of Captain Scott's last expedition. Sleeping bags such as these, caribou skin, very soft, very warm indeed, were absolutely fundamental to keeping the five of them warm at night. Coordinated from the supply ship Terra Nova, Lawrence Oates and the team successfully reached the pole on the 17th of January 1912. But their faces say it all. To their dismay, they found a Norwegian team had beaten them by a month. On the return journey, they battled malnutrition and hypothermia. Captain Oates, with severe frostbite, sacrificed himself to give his colleagues a chance to reach food and fuel. He left the tent with the celebrated words, I'm just going outside and maybe some time. It's just so incredible about how Captain Oates just did so much for his companions. I think he's really brave because he sacrificed himself to give his friends a chance to survive and it's a really noble thing to do. It was quite sad but at the same time absolutely inspirational. Oscar's being equipped with the modern clothing that breathes and protects against temperatures plunging to minus 30 or 40 degrees. Tom is being kitted out in a sort of multi-layered garb they wore a century ago. I feel like I can't really move at all and not really use my hands because of these big gloves, and it's very uncomfortable. The story of the expedition ends with the death of the remaining members of the party in their tent, 11 miles from base camp and salvation. One of the things I think is, is most remarkable is the way that Scott wrote his diary and letters, for example, to Oates's mother, um, right in the last day or two, when he must have known they were pinned down in the last camp, probably thinking they were going to die. It must have been so hard. Today's polar explorers acknowledge their debt to Scott and his team, their diaries, scientific research and Captain Oates' sleeping bag, treasures brought home from the bottom of the world. Kim Riley, BBC Look East, Cambridge. It's a remarkable story, isn't it? Yeah, very yeah. sad story. And the Scott Polar Research Institute is being refurbished at the moment and will reopen in June. Now, if you want any more information about the objects in your area or if you want to add your object to help build a history of the world, go to bbc.co.uk forward slash Cambridgeshire. A major new art exhibition has opened in the region and it's all about watercolours. It's another joint venture, this time between Tate Britain in London and a number of galleries, including the Castle Museum in Norwich, and includes some rarely seen work by people like Turner and John Sell Cotman. Mike Liggins has been to see it. I don't know about you, but I'm never quite sure how to behave in art galleries. Are you supposed to talk? It's very quiet in here. It's a question to which there is no easy answer. That aside, there is much to enjoy in this exhibition. Famous names, a world view of watercolours, and even a video on how to paint in watercolour. These three must be um, some of the most evocative, ethereal works of art. And if you like Turner's paintings, you'll love it. Andrew Moore is the art curator at the Castle Museum. He left his studio to the nation, and that is why uh, Tate Britain has such a wonderful collection. This entire section is drawn from, from the collection at Tate Britain. The exhibition looks at the use of light. A painting by John Sell Cotman stands next to a Turner. Cotman's uh, image of Mont Saint Michel is so much more um, sort of nailed by the design and the drawing of the image, whereas Turner's image is literally a sunset, a fish market on the beach. It's, it's, a, it's an evo evocative subject. There are watercolours painted in the 20th century, some surrealist paintings, 
which will be to some tastes and not others. Time, I just couldn't get what it was all about. But most of it I did like. You know, the scenes that you can actually recognise, I liked very much. Are you an artist yourself? Well, I'd like to be. We, we've been doing watercolour for about 18 months. Hit and miss. Definitely better than when I started, but still dreadful. Yeah. The exhibition lasts until April the 18th. It costs £3.10 for adults and you don't have to whisper. Mike Liggins, BBC Look East at the Castle Museum. Difficult for Mike. Never knowingly <laughs> underplayed his role, is it? <laughs> what, what a fabulous exhibition. I know. Isn't it? And if you do want to see more pictures from the exhibition, you can go to the BBC website for Norfolk. There it is. Now, there was a time when our most common farmland bird was the corn bunting. You see, I didn't know that. But over the last 40 years, the number has fallen by 90%. Now, bird watchers are flocking to Bedfordshire where a little pocket of hope has been found. Anna Todd reports. These fat little birds are few and far between. Not long ago it was unusual to see more than 20 corn buntings at a time, but here in a tiny corner of the Bedfordshire countryside, over a thousand are roosting. Spotted by a member of the public, word spread quickly. This is just absolutely magic. What's brought them together, serendipity or Mr Bumstead's grain, I don't know, but to get this number of corn buntings in one area is just brilliant. Corn buntings, whose flight call sounds like a spitting chip pan, are now so rare they're on the RSPB's red list. Intensive farming methods have seen their food sources disappear since the 1970s. But farmers like Steve Bumstead are making simple but positive changes, like leaving winter stubble and scattering leftovers from his barley crop. I'm a business. I've got, I've got to sort of produce food. To, that's part of, you know, it's part of my, it's most of my income that's coming in. The environment is, uh, is very much sort of a side issue or secondary issue, which we're quite keen on. I mean, let's face it, I live and work in the countryside. I want a beautiful countryside. Uh, and and my, my view is that as, uh, we, all farmers are custodians. So apart from the fact these rotund birds inspired the name for chubby children's character Billy Bunter, what else do we know? Well, they're known as the fat bird of the barley. The males are polygamous, usually having three females on the go. 16 is the known record, and their song is metallic, like jangling keys. At one time, this was such a common bird. It was actually, um, uh, some, some author wrote, uh, it was a scourge of the British countryside at one time, and uh, uh, it couldn't be further from the truth now because there's such a, a rare sight in the British countryside, and, and bird watchers really want to see corn buntings uh, because they are such a special bird. These corn buntings will head off to other parts of East Anglia to breed this summer, but next winter they'll be back in Steve's Field, putting on another impressive show for the cameras. Anna Todd, BBC Look East in Stotfold, Bedfordshire. Some important questions, really. I mean, if, they, if, if the record is one male for 16 females, how many of those birds were females and how many were males? Oh, dear. I didn't count them all there. <laughs> <laughs> Fat and polygamous, so yeah. that's what I remember. Yes. Bird of the barley. <laughs> Here's Julie with the weather. <laughs> I was so nervous about what you were going to so say. Was I, <laughs> I thought you might. <laughs> OK, well, I'm going to start with some amazing pictures that were taken by Rob. This seal was actually seen on the River Ouse at St Ives in Cambridgeshire. Now, Rob said it is very unusual for a seal to be seen this far up the river, and it was around for about three days before it disappeared. And uh, apparently there was a report a few weeks ago of a seal at Godmanchester as well. Absolutely fantastic. So thank you so much for sending that in, Rob. Now today it has been miserable.